we are now to the theme three, which is this, I'm sorry. Oh, the God, thank you very much for all of this. <laughs> 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 <For sure. laughs> and, and we are well in time, so you are doing a good job, in, in fact. Eh? Um, theme, theme three, it's services. Eh? And from, from your comments from the previous survey, um, there's no dispute that in 2030 vision that the service delivery will be done jointly by public and private entities. This is something that some of you have said in this survey. And there will be many more players as environmental intelligent drivers. Uh, and this, environment, this uh, environmental intelligent drives decision making. I mean, it's not only person, but also in, uh, intelligence coming from the computer. The second key element on the vision is that weather and climate information will be much better integrated in decision making at all the levels and will support complex systems and decisions in accelerating global economy, protection of life, property and property reduction. The optimistic views envisage also endless capabilities to meet the event growing user requirements such as reliable services at lo localized scale. In fact, service will be the, the one of the main issues of the future. The first speaker we invite is uh, Mr. Naoyuki Haseawa from head from Forecasting Japan Meteorological Agency. Uh, you have the floor. Yes, I, I just thought that everybody will be informed of the weather which may impact just over their, their life uh, through the best media in the, in the best format. This is not my prediction, this is just a vision or dream. And anyway, I think I expect much of this one from the private sector, in fact, uh, because they have a lot of uh, variety of means to deliver the information, and they are very quick to react to changing requirements. And of course, the public meteorological service alone cannot satisfy all the individual requirements. So uh, we, we expect very much from the public sector's contribution. And this can be only possible uh, when we put in place a good framework uh, to define the roles to be played by the private sector and public sector and perhaps academic as well. Thank you. Next person I'd like to inv invite to speak is Andrew Eccleston, uh, Secretary General of, uh, General Secretary, sorry, of Premet. Uh, basically the same question, uh, how do you see the roles of public sector, uh, the NMHS's uh, private sector meeting the demand of, of services, coordination, cooperation, uh, how is it working uh, in Europe? Thank you very much. I must apologize for arriving late. I uh, was actually waiting in the wrong place. I arrived here so early today that the signs weren't up. And <laughs> but I'm very, very pleased to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, the, the most important thing to emphasize is that the private sector needs the public sector to operate well and to be well funded. And so the private sector, certainly the members that I represent, will always help to support at the political interface, which is where the control often comes from. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that the, the picture varies enormously from one country to another, uh, how the relationship works and the demands that the governments place on the national weather services. So there will always be quite a difference between one region and another about how we deal with this. And I think the most important benchmark is how we serve the community. And anything that gets in the way of serving the community in the best way we can with the best science we have and the best technology, technology we have um, is unfortunately if there's a barrier. And one of the risks is that the public sector may seek to control the value chain between the science and the, the end user. And that's something that we need to be mindful of. Next speaker is Ralph Renner, president of the Weather Risk Management Association, and kind of a specific user. It's a specific user because that's the insurance sector. Um, you have a new point of view on the floor, please. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. As you said, I represent the weather risk management industry, insurers, brokers, 
uh, data providers. We are part of the weather enterprise, but we sit further down the value chain. Um, we, of course, require highest quality data to Mr. Forsen's point earlier. Without this data, we are not able to provide the services that we offer. Um, we help in modeling, we help in understanding, but also crucially in mitigating weather and climate risks, often for um, societies that are very um, um, unresilient and are very exposed. So for us, um, all I would do is encourage you on your path to come up with better and uh, higher quality data sets because this is really what is at the core of, of our work. There are some issues around um, data licenses and ownership, but the, the, the biggest concern for us is top quality data. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Christophe Coudernet to speak, uh, Secretary General of the IAHS. Uh, so from the hydrology perspective, which we haven't really touched on very much today at all, uh, the need for science to service transfer and how the meteorological and hydrological community can combine their efforts. Is that question make sense? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, when it comes to services, we deal not only with data and models, but more widely with information, knowledge, methods, uncertainties, understanding, assimilation, in fact, all the facets of intelligence in the wide definition, and not only artificial intelligence, but the, the real one, human one. And so, with the platform, I think we must really consider epistemological aspects, especially the diversity of mindsets and skills, the cultural differences and languages, interdisciplinarity, ergonomy, etc. And from the hydrological perspective, I think we really have to facilitate an intelligent articulation or interoperability of weather, climate, and hydrological services, keeping in mind the strong intrinsic complexity of hydrological systems and their interfaces with the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the oceans, etc. And so it is really a, a challenge for the platform to have this pillar on hydrology and water-related uh, environment issues. As a scientist myself, I think we have to uh, really facilitate the translation of methods, information, knowledge out of the labs and of the publications into value and services for the society and the end users. As the Secretary General of AHS, the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, I think we have to bring the scientists, the individual scientists and teams towards the platform and for that to draw their interest and fight against some perverse effects of actual competition, money biases and bibliometric assessment, which keeps many people and knowledge in the labs, in the publications and not, doesn't outreach. And so we can work on agenda setting, ultimate objectives, new ways of recognizing the engagement of people, etc., all together. And as an academic, finally, I think because most of us are both scientists and teachers, we have to really value the new didactics and competency approaches that we are developing in the universities in order to develop the capacities of all the people involved in the chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have Agnes Kihari, Kihazi, um, for more or less. <laughs> from, uh, she's permanent representative of Tanzania, uh, WMO, and from developing countries and from, from developing part of the world, th this part of services would be in the future even more important. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, coming from R1 Africa, uh, starting from data up to forecasting and up to service delivery, we have gap in Africa. And I think it's high, it's high time now for us through these um, uh, discussions to come up with an um, agreement on how we can assist each other so that we improve services 
in the globe, including Africa. Yeah, to me, in part of for service delivery and demand, we find that uh, currently there is an increasing demand of services, and uh, specifically because of the um, climate change, because we have uh, extreme events, increasing impacts of extreme events in our countries. So the demand of services is high. But the capacity to provide these services, you find that is in very low in most of our countries, if I talk in the perspective of uh, Regional Association One. So what, what to do? I think it is important to find a way how we can integrate weather and climate services in decision making, but uh, WMO should come up with a, a, a way to assist members to give uh, accurate services. And I think uh, inclusion of private sector, as discussed here, is a good idea, but um, there is a need to come up with a, a procedure and uh, define roles of uh, each sector, roles of private, roles of public sector, and how we can work together, and at the end should be a win-win situation. This is my comment, thank you. And we will certainly be talking more about roles and responsibilities tomorrow in one of our themes. Uh, I'd like to invite Yang Yu uh, to speak next, uh, Deputy Administrator to the China Meteorological Association. Uh, in China, how do you see uh, technology helping to improve services in the, uh, to meet the growing demand of users? Thank you. Yes, the technology has always the potential to improve the service. To answer your question, I would like to uh, cite a practice in China and as an example. In China, the National Bureau of Statistics carries out a nationwide survey based on 40,000 samples every year. The survey produces annual satisfaction rating for public weather service. The latest Rating for 2018 exceeded 90.8, which was a record high and for the first time over 90 point. It is not further that the public gave the highest evolution to the convenience of weather service. CMA has just put into operation the graded forecast from minutes to weeks since 2018. 17. They let coincide with the above jump in public satisfaction for weather forecast accuracy. The graded forecast enables target the location specific weather service in weather APPs run by public or private sector. And I want to point that the above success should not be credited to the National Meteorological Service alone. Actually, it is a practice example of the public-private partnership. In China, NMS is the authority in ensuring public weather forecast, forecasts and the last warning. We also share our graded forecast and the warning information with uh, private uh, companies. We encourage them to redistribute the forecast and the warning to wider public through their own weather APPs to social media. At the same time, the private uh, companies are able to develop specialized and uh, personalized service based on our seamless graded uh, forecast. The Partnership has constructed an ecosystem of weather service in which we take short wins together. We better meet the green needs of the public and have greatly imprecise better needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our last speaker today, it's uh, well known for, for all of us. Is Michel Jarreau, he's former Secretary General of WMO and President Emeritus of EMO. And 
this idea of the broad and inclusive thinking, the service, the products to serve long-term socioeconomic interests, this kind of cross-disciplinary uh, items you have been talking here, your point. Thank, thank you very much. I will slightly disobey your, your instruction. Yeah. <laughs> um, because the comments I want to make because of my background, uh, some of them will apply to several themes, including those that you will handle to, to, to tomorrow. The, the thing which struck me when I read, first of all, I think it's a very good initiative, and I'm very pleased to see so many actors around the table, so that I think it's, a, it's an excellent thing. The thing which I would suggest is that it's not sufficient to have the governments, to have the private sector, and to have the academia there. Some of the emerging actors, which are getting very important, particularly with respect to climate change, are also the local authorities, the region, the big cities, and many things. And when it comes to decision making, I think it's important that they are also uh, integrated into the thinking for service delivery, and ultimately, actually, for decision making. And we know of a few countries where big decisions are easier to take at the sub-national level than at the national or federal level. The other point I wanted to make, which applies again to, uh, to many things, is I, I, I was struck when I read all the comments by the great optimism. It's good to be optimistic. At the same time, the time horizon 2030 is almost like tomorrow. I don't believe that in 2030 we shall have completely solved the problem raised by Agnes about the, the capacity uh, gap development. I don't believe we shall have made the progress that some of the comments suggested about the quality of the forecast, that it's so great at such a detailed level that everyone in the world, in ev the most remote place, will have access to that. Actually, for me, an even uh, more serious challenge, and I'm not, so uh, you may feel that I'm talking about a particular country, but actually I'm thinking of several countries on this planet. Despite the huge scientific evidence, in, uh, in, uh, in a very, very uh, convincing, presented in a very convincing way by the scientists, many top decision makers, many top leaders don't seem to take that on board. Of course, I'm thinking of climate change, but it applies also to disaster, uh, disaster prevention. And often action is taken after the disaster, not in a preventive mode before the disaster. So when it comes to that, I think it's very important that we in WMO, and I'm sorry, I'm using we, uh, Petri, not, um, I, I appreciate you, I'm not in your, in your job any longer, but, but I still feel very much that WMO is, is, uh, is my family, is my raison d'etre. So we, we need to take that on board and how the top decision makers can be sensitized. It's good to sensitize the public, the young people, the blah, 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 but if we don't sensitize the president, the heads of states, and the top government, we are going to have a, 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 a challenge. My last comment, because I, uh, I want to try to uh, not to uh, overuse the, the, the time, is the fact that we should not forget what is the Petri showed the red book with mission of WMO. And in this red book, if you look at it, if there is one priority which is topping every other priority is the protection of life. This is a public service. And we have to, we have really to make sure that we can, uh, we can deliver that. And the partnership is definitely, I welcome this, this partnership. And, but please, associate the other uh, actors. Let me stop here, thank you. Thank you. Well, you see, it's a broader and inclusive point of view. Uh, now, an applause to everyone who has <laughs> made an intervention. Um, to uh, kind of summarize uh, the comments from uh, theme three, I'd like to invite uh, Louis Uccellini to speak, uh, Director of National Weather Service. Um, can you give us a, a little summary and uh, put it in perspective? IDSS, Impact Based Decision Support. Um, what are the lessons that have been learned? And if you can speak a little bit about WRN as well, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think when you put the word little summary, you, that, that, that challenge is a little too high for me, okay? <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit broader than that. So I'm glad I've, I followed uh, Michelle Giraud. Um, I had this, this um, comment written down when we introduced <coughs> services. Um, you know, have we really defined it um, in terms of what, how do we connect 
of what we do to providers of information, safety information, now medical information, uh, et cetera, um, and receivers, the customers themselves. And, and um, the success of the service is dependent upon the whole chain, as I think uh, Christopher um, you know, really uh, emphasized uh, in his presentation. Um, so uh, the successful services that we provide now really make a difference. We understand that. Um, and what it, in terms of summarizing it, I think it's the realization of the intrinsic value of our climate, weather, and water products. And um, Tim, you reminded me several years ago about the quote uh, from Alan Murphy. Um, it might come to a shock to some people in the room if I use that quote, so I'll use it for shock value, make sure everybody's staying awake here. But Alan Murphy wrote in 1993, there's no intrinsic value in a forecast. The intrinsic value is realized by how that forecast influences decisions. And with that in mind, I would contend that from the last panel discussion, the role of the forecaster is going to be around a long time. So I disagree with the consensus of view that you presented before. Their job will change. But people who are using this information to make decisions, whether it comes from a private sector firm or a public sector firm, wants a human being in that loop. And the forecasters are, are really the experts to a lot of the customers uh, that are out there trying to decide whether they're going to close a road, a city, whatever. So uh, just keep that in mind. Second point is that the demand pie for what we do is getting bigger. I mean, it's grown to a point now where people expect us to make perfect forecasts. And, and, and Tim, again, is right. There's no such thing as a perfect forecast. But the expectations are increasing in what we do because people understand that their lives and livelihood actually depend on what we do. And th this increasing demand pie, I contend, is what's changing the dynamic between the public and the private sector in the provision of services. Because if the, if the demand pie is the same and the private sector comes in and slices off pie, part of that pie, the public sector immediately gets worried, gets defensive, um, and, and the battle lines are drawn. That's exactly what happened in the 1980s and early 90s in the United States. Okay? With the recognition that the, that the man pie is getting bigger, there's no way the public sector can provide all of that service that's needed in this growing area because people are using our information in ways that I never dreamed of when I was a student. You know? Out at day 10, for, for crying out loud. I mean, I thought we, we'd be doing a good job in my generation if we got to days three in a useful forecast, OK? So that demand pie is growing incredibly. And we're seeing our products and services, again, I'm talking collectively in this room, being used in energy, in agriculture, and you just name it, recreation, transportation, in health. People are actually predicting health factors today based on what we do, all right? So this is, this is really important for us to realize. And I was glad to hear the private sector folks say that they depend on the public sector as a sort of a core to move forward. That's not only important from the growth of business perspective, but customers who are using forecasts are demanding consistency. So what we do in the United States now, before we release warnings, forecasts for extreme events, we have chat sessions with all the private partners who want to join in. We don't tell them what to say. We don't tell them what to do. The information flows both ways. But we're striving towards consistency because people's decisions will rely just as much on that uh, as on what they think or the accuracy. That's happening today. So with respect to impact-based decision support services, this is a key part of it. Uh, we're working with uh, partners uh, in the emergency management community and public safety at every government level in the United States. So we better be giving them consistent products in, in the face of a tornadic uh, outbreak or severe um, flooding or fire, uh, the fire situation. Um, so that consistency aspect is important. Those partners in the government sectors also have private sector support. It's, it's not an either or. It's, it's not an either nor. They, because they want to try to get a consensus because they know nobody's giving a perfect, a perfect forecast. So 
That dynamic is growing as well. And I think this is something that uh, people need to understand, uh, that that's actually become a basis, I think, for the success, uh, the huge success, I contend, of the private sector across the entire value chain uh, in the United States. While the public sector, I can, I can guarantee you that our forecasts are busier today than they've ever been because they're providing these kinds of services. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm really hopeful for the future um, of what we do um, in the whole spectrum of activities. When we say climate, weather, and water, I, I'm always reminded I gotta throw in space weather too. So it's from the sun to the sea, and, um, and then you got the whole scale from uh, climate down to the mesoscale. I just think we're, we're poised uh, to make uh, tremendous strides, not only from a customer perspective, but I really believe that we're influencing humanity in a way that uh, people are recognizing. So thank you. Thank you very much for your summary, Dr. Rossellini. And then we have come to the end of these uh, three, themes of, three themes of today. And after this excellent uh, discussion uh, of these major three themes, I, I would like to go back to Mr. Professor Talas to, for, a brief, for a brief introduction of the WMO value proposition what are the concrete proposal of the OCP of this open consultative platform and how WMO will facilitate the mechanism? Thank you. Uh, so uh, as I said in my opening, this is an important uh, topic for us and uh, to be successful in serving the outside world and, and our customers at the country level, we have to bring these three players more together and, and we have to start the, uh, enhance the cooperation between various uh, various parties. So we will, uh, during this uh, coming one and a half weeks, we will we are supposed to approve Geneva Declaration, which is uh, which is stating our, our, our uh, willingness to uh, be inclusive and open open the uh, the doors for for private sector, especially, and, and also enhance our cooperation with uh, with science and innovation sector. And uh, we are happy to be. Uh, uh, facilitator and, and uh, as I said, uh, our plan is to organize a global data conference early next year to discuss uh, some of the uh, striking data issues that were just discussed uh, uh, earlier earlier today. And, um, and, and then uh, we are uh, happy to deal with the uh, decision making process. Uh, we will pre prepare some material on that. And, uh, and then uh, we would like to invite uh, uh, the private sector and also academic sector to be part of our future technical commission work. We are just carrying out a major reform of, uh, of WMO constituent bodies and uh, the proposal is to have two technical commissions and uh, two, n two new science-based uh, bodies and, um, and, and we would like to see uh, both the private sector and, uh, and uh, academic sector contributing more to those. And, uh, and, and then we have to think uh, what, what is the most beneficial way of running the business uh, from, uh, from uh, our customers, uh, from the government's pers perspective, and, uh, and, uh, and we, we plan to organize a workshop uh, along those lines and, uh, and, and invite you once again, and we are happy to take the ball in our, our hands. We are grateful for, for, uh, for World Bank, who, who was uh, a little bit initiating this process, and. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and since it's our mandate to be a major player here, we are happy to take that uh, challenge, uh, challenge into account. And, uh, and we will also allocate uh, proper secretarial resources for that. We are also discussing at the moment the budget of WMO for the coming years, and uh, this is also one of our proposals for the coming, coming years' uh, budget to, to, to provide some concrete uh, resources for facilitating the process. So with these words, uh, thanks again for coming, and, uh, and we will continue tomorrow. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, one last thing uh, before we wrap things up. David Grimes, uh, current WMO president, I'd like to invite you to uh, give a day one su summary. We have three themes covered, data, forecasts, and services. Um, what is your view on how WMO can stimulate the public, private, academic, um, NGO engagement uh, surrounding these? So, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, and I, I would like to cover maybe 
uh, all of the themes that you just discussed, as well as the two that you're going to discuss tomorrow, are actually all interrelated. It's not really um, easy to separate all of these things. I think a key message that uh, was pervasive in, in all three discussions and likely will be again tomorrow is um, the need that um, the, we need to strengthen the relationships with all of the actors who are going to make this contribution and as uh, Michelle Giraud said, from not just from the kind of the upstream, but recognize all the downstream practitioners. And those decision makers uh, make decisions with regards to uh, large policies, but they also make decisions that are even on a micro scale about the well-being of, um, you know, uh, a, a decision a company might make. make for instance, in, in, uh, energy, uh, in an energy domain. And when you actually start to map that out, you realize uh, another key theme, which is everyone has a reliance in everyone else in this process. And when you recognize that, it means that in order to ensure that we move in a uh, collaborative way forward, you have to think about what is kind of that framing aspect. And usually that's done by identifying a few key areas that we can all work on together and we can articulate how this dialogue will actually furnish good outcomes to others. So it's kind of, a, I think, a second theme. Uh, you know, it was interesting, I, I was uh, in my own country, we have a, we're, we're starting to talk about data is the new fuel. And when they use data, they don't actually mean data in the same traditional sense that we do. They actually are referring to it as uh, information resources. And, you know, my data is someone else's information and, you know, et cetera. And if you actually expand your thinking about information as kind of the new fuel, and that's a fuel that supports decision making in the economy, um, all of the things that we've talked about today actually form the basis. And the broader that information is made available. And if you look at the G7 that just um, um, two G7s ago and the G7 that was held in Ottawa, um, articulated the, the foundational benefits to the environment, to the economy, and to society by making information actively available. This also requires advocacy by all the players. So um, I like this, uh, there was a context raised which we should think about, which is this kind of, you might call it, um, you know, like the uh, stock exchange. Well, an exchange mechanism that recognizes how value and data rights, intellectual property, very important part of how societies flourish. So the idea of how that might work in a way that um, is mutually beneficial to all of the parties might be uh, interesting to explore. My last point is something that has not brought, brought up very, um, uh, and it might come up tomorrow, which relates to the fact that when we look at and WMO, um, is an organization that was brought together to facilitate members, the, the, the states, okay? And, and as Petri said, it's a little ambiguous, what do we mean by states? Typically you think of governments, but governments are acting in the broad interest of the country. So in that context, what I, what I would say is that we're not all in the same place. And our members and the vast majority of our members have lots of needs and lots of requirements. And their ability to kind of have a discussion like this that is probably for organizations who are more mature, um, you need to, and this is a point on education, you need to actually help strengthen, even at the institutional or governance, government levels, the value propositions associated 
with the kind of discussion we had had. That's actually very important if you want to bring 85% of WMO membership along. So um, I look forward to what's going to happen tomorrow. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, one last thing. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the joint statement that we intend to put together? Uh, yes. Um, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the Congress has uh, two uh, significant uh, subjects about the public-private. One of them is a declaration by all members, and Petri has alluded to that. And this really kind of sets a framework. Executive Council EC70, which is the, the major meeting before this Congress, affirmed some principles in a policy framework for how this engagement should follow. So it's kind of positioning, helping to position our members into this place. And so we're, um, we're, we're proposing that uh, we would endorse at uh, the Congress a statement from this platform as a way, as a, as a pathway of kind of setting the context going forward. And we have kind of a draft zero up, up on the screen, which looks at some fundamental principles around strengthening partnerships. And, you know, maybe based on the conversation, that's more about enabling collaboration, uh, identifying some of the key global challenges the idea of what might be a topic that, or an action, concrete action that we might focus on within sort of each of the five theme areas, and then how do we uh, kind of establish kind of this, this, um, this relationship that we're starting? How do we kind of make it meaningful? And how do we support the larger global um, decision making that is uh, made a in variety of places. So it's got an outline. We're going to have a little working group, hopefully get some insights from this, uh, this gathering to uh, uh, be part of our, our, uh, our assertion. Uh, this is our next step. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Well, an important remark, thank you very much, Mr. Grants. An important remark will be that suggestions, comments, are, and also your confirmation or even decline uh, to join this statement or to, to bring ideas to this statement can be sent to the email ppewmo.in -E before 5 p.m. of today. Anything you want to say, please send this email uh, with your ideas, and also if you're willing, if you're willing let's to participate on that. You ready to close your? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We're in time. So that's good for WMO, for all of us. Thank you very much for coming. And remember, we have the second round tomorrow. So we hope you all of us, you will be again tomorrow. Thank you very much.